All right, let's see. Good evening, everybody. Good evening to you too, sir. Mm -hmm. Hello. <laughs> Hello. It is good to be back in the saddle again and almost done with this, uh, this study of the uh, book of Revelation. We are coming quickly towards the end. Uh, good evening to our online viewers uh, that are there as well as those of you who are here in the zoom room uh, can everybody hear me fine yes all right yeah. perfect uh all right let's uh it's everybody good we're all good good week oh well, isaac my man i didn't hear you come in okay yeah slip i got right. yeah okay. <laughs> slip, 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 slip. <laughs> I, I eased on in there. I see. You slid right on in. All right, y'all. So let's go ahead and get started since everybody's good. Uh, let's, uh, it, at the end, we'll, audio. what's that? You said something about the audio. I didn't, who was that? Not sure. I think that was Paul. Oh, what what did what, what you say, Uncle Paul? Oh, okay, yeah, I mean, Uncle Paul's on. Yeah. Well, good evening, Uncle Paul. He, I don't think he can hear you. Oh, okay. Uh, I did, well, I think at some point he'll figure it out. Uh, but uh, we'll, we'll go on. Um, I sent him the link. I forget. He kept, he asked me for the link. I kept forgetting to send him the link, and uh, so I went ahead and then at the last minute tonight, as I ran up here and realized, oh, I still haven't sent Uncle Paul the link and sent him the link so he could join us. So, but good to have him here, and good to have you guys online. So let's just open up in prayer as we go into this Word of God. God, our Father, we thank you. God of heaven, you are wonderful. We praise you for this opportunity. We can come together virtually to study your word and to learn more about you. God, we continue to ask, has been our prayer from the beginning, that you give us supernatural discernment, that we will be able to understand your word and discern the times to be able to see the days and what is coming and how we are to behave and how we act during those times. Lord, continue to bless us and keep us and protect us, guide us, heal us, restore us, lead us, love us, forgive us, and all the things that you pour into us, continue to pour into us as we continue to learn to love you. Help us, Lord, to keep our minds stayed on you. Remove the, the distractions of the world that we continue to live inside out. Let your spirit in us be the light that guides our path, that we will no longer be phased by what happens in this world. We love you, Lord, and look forward to you joining us tonight, that your spirit will be present with us, that you will be here that we will, uh, our hearts will be touched and that we will understand for it is in your son, Jesus Christ's name that we do pray and believe. Amen. Amen. All right. So y'all at the end, what I would like to do, if you guys have any, any prayer requests, uh, let's, we'll have those and we'll, at the end, uh, we'll go through and make sure that we pray for uh, those who are in need, uh, whether they're on this Bible study or not, family members of, of people that are dealing with going through some stuff, because these are some some trying times. You know, we we had this school shooting in Missouri the other day, it just another school shooting. And it's a shame that we're in this place where kids have to be trained. It's one thing to go through earthquake drills. When you live in the state of California, it's another thing to have to go through shoot active shooter drills because we live in America. Uh, but nonetheless, let's get into this word. Uh, so we started uh, two weeks ago because we didn't have Bible study last week, but two weeks ago, we got into chapter 21, which is the next to last uh, chapter in the book of Revelation. And where we start off in chapter 21 is where everything ended in chapter 20, the, the, the lake of fire, uh, Satan, the beast, and the false prophet have all been cast into the lake of fire for all eternity where they will burn. And, and those who serve them, those who worship them, those who receive the mark of the beast, everyone who bowed the knee 
uh, to Satan, they're all there. And now we're in this place of a new beginning that we saw uh, the heaven and earth that was existed as we knew it had literally uncreated. It, it was gone. It was gone into the lake of fire as well. And so we get into verse one of chapter 21, and it talks about the new heaven and the new earth. And so everything that we had known before or everything that we know now is nothing what's going to happen in the new heaven and the new earth. And there's so much more that's going to be different uh, than what we see there or what we have known, uh, that there's not a whole lot of water uh, in, associated with the new heaven because we, we looked at the word of God and how the sea is sometimes associated with evil. And so there is no sea in, in the new heaven and the new earth. Uh, and then we get into what new Jerusalem our new earthly home, the celestial city that is uh, in heaven that descends down uh, to the earth. And it's just this whole new place. And everything that we see is just keeps going on and talking about all the everything that is no longer happening there. Things that we are experiencing here will no longer be happening in this new, the new heaven and the new earth, this new Jerusalem. Uh, as we get down into verse four, there's no more war, there's no more famine, no more disease, no more starvation, no more death, and no more murder. And that means that nothing sad, disappointing, deficient, or wrong will ever be a part of this new life uh, that we start to see in Revelation 21. And uh, so we see uh, some correlation between uh, the words of, of God on the throne and Jesus on the cross, that it is done. Then we know that what he's referring to is that everything has been changed. It is no longer uh, this battle anymore between good and evil because evil is no longer around. It's just good. There's no battle. It's done. Um, and then... Let's see. There, yeah, they, just a whole different way of life, a whole different vibe that's going on in this new heaven and earth. And we get, uh, um, to understand, ah, this, this one verse where God talks about the, the list of people who are not going to be, this is, you know, he's lined up the people where now we're facing judgment and he has the book, the two books. Uh, what do I have it in my notes here? Uh, but when we get to the new heaven and new Jerusalem, there was a list of people that were not going to be present. Anybody remember what was number one on the list? Because we talked about it extensively. Cowards. Cowards. Thank you. He says specifically cowards, unbelievers, abominable, uh, murderers, sexually immoral people, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars. These are the, are the ones who were not going to be in the new heaven and the new earth. And, and we spent a great deal of time to talk about the fact that the number one type of person he said would not be there are cowards. And so I don't know about you, but over the course of the two weeks, one of the things that stood out for me in my spirit is what stands out about cowards is that what uh, outside of being fearful cowardice is what keeps us from standing for truth cowardice keeps us from believing what is right cowardice lets us be influenced by the world and not want to take a stand for what's right because we're going to be afraid of what people are going to say what people are going to think and how they're going to label us and so even before he says unbelievers are not going to be able to partake in this with me, which we already know, but he says the first group of people are the cowards that you know about how good I am. You know about my strength. You know about all the things that I've done for you. Every situation that I have saved you from, every uh, sickness that I've healed you, every time your back was against the wall, I made a way when there was no way. And yet, you still cower because you are afraid to stand up for me. 
And so he says, the first group of people who are not coming to this place with me are the cowards. Cowards, I mean, it kind of reminds me of the uh, that old song by TLC, No Scrubs. And Jesus said, no cowards. Bounce, baby, bounce. Get up, up out of here because we ain't got no room for you. And it leads us to where we are in verse 10 is where we're going to start off tonight in chapter 21, verse 10. And I'm going to uh, read, read down to verse 15. And so in verse 10, it reads, and he carried me away in the spirit. Again, this is John talking about uh, the angel that he was talking to. He carried me away in, a, in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. And she had a great and high wall with 12 gates and 12 angels and at the gates uh, and names written on them, which were the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel, three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. Now the wall in the, of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And he who talked with me had a gold reed to measure the city, its gates, and its walls. And so we'll stop there. And then we'll pick up verse 16 uh, when we get through this section. So here we are at verse 10. He comes and is, says he's been swept away, carried up in the spirit to show this great city. Uh, and so the bride, as we know, the, uh, the new church is, the bride is pictured as the city of New Jerusalem because the city is composed of people. You know, he's not going to marry a city, he, but he is going to marry the people uh, or join in union in a very close and intimate relationship with the people. And, and we may refer to a city as uh, a, a safe city or a crime ridden city because of its people. As John views God's heavenly creation, he is impressed by the brilliance of the city. And we're talking about the brilliance, the sparkling of the city, the brilliance of the city, the size of the city, and the beauty of the city. And so then we get into verse 11. He talks about the jasper. Uh, j this use of the word jasper is a transliteration, not a translation, a transliteration of the Greek word. In Hebrew, it is translated as a jewel, but jasper is an has an opaque color. Uh, however, John is referring to a completely clear diamond, a perfect gem with brilliant light of God's glory shining out of it and streaming all over the new heaven and the new earth. In verse 12, we get to, talks about the walls of the city. Now, in biblical time, walls were erected for the protection of the city. So when you established and built a new city, the very first thing you had to do was to build walls around it. And the walls is what gave you protection. That gave you the advantage where you could be safe and feel secure. Now, um, we have to under wonder, uh, and maybe you don't, but I do, but I wonder why is a wall erected around the city, the New Jerusalem, in the new heaven and the new earth, when evil is, has been defeated, there's no more crime, there's no more evil to battle against. What is the purpose of the wall? Why build a wall when you don't have any need for safety and security because there's nothing there to be afraid of? Anybody care to say anything? Could it be like a representation of like a monument type thing since it had the names written on it? Okay, you're on the right track. You are definitely on the right track. Anybody else want to throw something out there? All right, no problem. Uh, before I uh, go on to my part, uh, Chantel, I want you to read Colossians 3.3 3 when we get to that, uh, get to it. Colossians 3.3. 3. Uh, so the uh, here again, I, I've shared with you guys, you've been with me for most of this year, 
that I get tend to get a little uh, nerd out when I start studying the word of God. And so when you hear about this new Jerusalem uh, in this heavenly city where there's no more evil and no more crime and there's nothing to be afraid of, he erects a wall. But you have to understand that the, the, uh, the wall serves as a reminder to those of us that God, the God of love, has protected his people. It is a perpetual reminder that he has always been a, a protector and that he will continue to be our protector. Even when we don't need to be protected, he is reminding us that I have been with you from the beginning of time. From the very foundation of the earth, I have built this to protect you and you have been my people. And now we are really and finally at a place where all the scriptures that have said that you will be my people and I will be your God, now we are seeing the real life application. We are actually feeling God as our God and we are as his people. And that wall is the reminder that his love has protected us from the very beginning. Even through all the calamity that was going on during uh, the, the uh, Armageddon, and through all this time of the, the Antichrist and the beast doing their thing, still God's love was there protecting. And, and even right now, while we are going through the things that we're going through, God's love is still protecting us. Sometimes you still may feel alone. You might feel that you're the only one in the struggle that you're in. You, you might even feel like, why am I going through whatever it is that I'm going through? But the fact of the matter is God's love is still protecting us. And so he, this wall serves as a reminder that we always should remember that he had protected us from the beginning. It, the wall is an external memorial to the fact that our lives have been hidden <coughs> with Christ in God, not hidden from Christ, hidden with Christ in God. Let's hear Colossians 3.3. 3. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. For you died and now your life is hidden with Christ in God. This is what he's saying. This is what th this whole point of love that we are together, not apart, not hidden from anybody else, but hidden with Christ. This city has 12 gates with the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. Israel. The gates are, are staffed with angels who welcome those possessing the right and privilege of entering the city. So essentially, you don't have the backstage pass anybody who's ever been to a concert and you had a backstage pass you know how envious everybody is of you because you get to go where nobody else gets to go and in this case there are angels posted the security looking out for those who have the rights and privileges to uh, dwell with god and though they'll, they'll, they're mounted there at the gates and so we get into let's see here before we get into verse 13 and 14 uh, Catherine, can you pull up Acts chapter one, uh, verses 23 through 26? And then uh, Lisa, uh, Gospel of John chapter 14, verse two. All right. Verse 13 continues on about the gates. Uh, verse 13 uh, says that there are three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, three gates on the west. And, the, and now the wall of the city had 12 foundations. Uh, these three gates, each of the four directions, north, south, east, and west, the foundation of the gates have the names of 12 disciples. And here again, with my mind, is Judas's name on one of the foundations because he was one of the 12, right? I wonder, is it him or is it Matthias? Let's hear Acts 1, verses 23 through 26. So they proposed two men, Joseph called Barsabas, also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two men, I'm sorry, show us which of these two you have chosen to take over this 
apolistic ministry, which Judas left to go where he belongs. Then they cast lots and the lot fell to Matthias. So he was added to the 11 apostles. Do we have an answer to that question? Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Judas went to where he belonged and then Matthias was added to the number, to the 11. So out of the 12 disciples, Matth Matthias is one of the 12 disciples whose name is on the foundation of the gates. And so here, these men are the foundation of the gate. Now, those of you who, who know a little bit about building and may not know a whole lot, but essentially you, anybody, most people understand that the foundation is the part of the, destruct of the structure that determines how strong a structure is going to be. So when you have a house that is built on a crappy or a shaky foundation, the sturdiness of that house is not certain that anytime anything blows, anything shakes, it, it's going to fall. A, a home or a building that has a solid foundation rooted deep in the ground is going to be stronger. And the interesting part is when you build a building, the taller the building, the deeper the foundation has to go. And so what he, he tells us that the, these walls, that, that the gates that are surrounding the city that are uh, uh, connecting the wall are built on the foundation of the faith of these disciples, that this, these are strong men of faith and the gates are strong. As a solid foundation, which side side note, start thinking for yourself about the sturdiness of your faith, because faith is the foundation of everything we do in this life, this Christian life, this Christian walk. Look, start looking at your foundation. What's what's happening? What's shaping your foundation? And does it stand when you face the test? So now we get to verse 15. Uh, he talks about the, the reed, the golden reed he used to measure the city. The reed was used as a common measurement tool at that time. It was equivalent to a yardstick, not necessarily the same equivalent distance, but this is the idea that if you use a yardstick today, you would use a reed then. Um, the, yeah, the fact that it was used to measure. The common uh, belief, according to theologians, is that a reed was usually approximately 10 feet long, which was the standard at the time. And so this action that is being taken is God, uh, by God, is measuring all that he sees, indicating that ownership of everything that's here belongs to him. It's the same as when you go into a new house and you take your, your measuring tape with you because you're putting in new cabinets. Uh, you're going to put in a new uh, new carpet. You're, you're measuring the area where the carpet's going to end and the tile is going to go down. Uh, where you're going to hang the picture, it's yours. And so God is measuring what's his. Now we get to verse 16. The city is laid out as a square. Its length is as great as its breadth. And, the measured, and he measured the city with the reed. 12,000 furlongs, its length, breadth, and height are equal. Then he measured its wall, 144 cubits, according to the measure of a man, that is, of an angel. The construction of the wall was jasper, and the city was pure gold like clear glass. The foundation of the wall of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third uh, Chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth uh, chiropras, the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. The twelve gates were the twelve pearls. Each individual gate was one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. That's verses 16 through verse 21. That's all he says. The city was laid out as a, 
as a square. Uh, this divine city is a is a perfect square in length, width, and height. It is measured and determined to be 12,000 furlongs. 12,000 furlongs in length, 12,000 furlongs in width, and 12,000 uh, furlongs in height. Many scholars have believed this to be the equivalent of 1,500 miles, 1,500 miles. Now, to put this in perspective, to truly understand how great and how massive this city is, this, remember, this is just a city, 1,500 miles, 1,500 would run from the state of Maine to the southernmost point of the state of Florida, and then from the eastern seaboard to the state of Colorado. So that's a pretty big chunk to be considered a city, right? Mm -hmm. From Maine to Florida, from the East Coast all the way to California. We're talking about going two, two different time zones. That's the Eastern to the Mountain time zone. Uh, all right. but, but then he says it's 1,500 miles high. 1,500 miles long, 1,500 miles wide, 1,500 miles tall. You know, skyscrapers don't go that tall. Right. <laughs> Somebody looked up on Google the tallest skyscraper. And, and we'll compare that with height. I didn't think about that in, 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 uh, when I was doing this. This is a big, big city with plenty of room for all the saints. I mean, because essentially we're not, if we look at it as just how we look at that little that space of the United States, you're looking at mountains, you're looking at rivers, farms, wild, you know, forests, uh, nature. But if, in this case, you're looking at a city that's just going to be continuously populated, 1,500 miles long, 1,500 miles wide, and 1,500 miles tall. It's a big it's city. The, it's the Burj Khalifa in Dubai. Yeah. And how tall is it? 2,720 feet. How much? 2,720 feet 2720 feet so that is almost a half a mile from the ground because there's 5280 feet in a mile so this thing this tallest skyscraper that we can build at this time with our technology goes halfway to a mile half of one mile but this city that God has constructed is 1,500 miles. This is huge. And you can imagine how high, high up that is. That's, I mean, that's out of the Earth's atmosphere, 1,500 miles. So that means it goes all the way to heaven. Say again? So that means it goes all the way to heaven. It reaches the heaven. Right. Well, it actually it descended down from heaven. Right. So you, but it's still part of it is up in the sky, you know, part, partially here on earth and partially in sky in the sky. But this is huge. You know, you did when you really put this in perspective, this is huge what we're talking about. And, and mm -hmm. so when you look at this, this skyscraper, that's uh, almost a half a mile in the air, uh, you literally are going to need 3000 of those stacked on top of each other. Which is kind of crazy to think in, about it. I thought I was in awe when I just saw it in person last. <laughs> 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 right. I mean, you know, you 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 go to something like that, and you like I remember the first time I saw the Grand Canyon, and I was just completely blown away. Yeah. And that thing is only what two and a half miles deep, three miles deep, maybe. Yes, that's it. But it looks like it goes on forever. Forever. Mm -hmm. And here, here we're talking about a city that is going 1,500 miles into the sky. Especially if you go out on that skywalk. Forget that. That ain't happening. Man, you got You have to do that. that no. That's fun. 
I, right. I can't even I can't even watch it on TV without my knee, uh, legs turning to uh, pasta. Let's hear uh, John 14, too. Give me one second. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you I go to prepare a place for you. All right. So this this scripture in John. Uh, Jesus talking and said, and if I go and I go and prepare and no, in my father's house are many mansions. Most of us have spent our lifetime really not understanding the, the context of how Jesus is presenting this, that in my father's house, there are many mansions. But if you put it in the context of what we just read in Revelation, 1,500 miles long, 1,500 miles wide, 1,500 miles tall, now it becomes a little clear. Okay, in this place, <laughs> it can hold a whole lot, a lot of people, a lot of houses. I don't know how we're going to be living. But Jesus said, in my father's house, there are many mansions. And, and when you go into uh, verse three of, four, of John 14, and he says, and if I go to prepare a place for you, this, this new Jerusalem, new city, I will come again to receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. So here is this place that he has prepared that will hold all of us. A city, a new city, new heaven, a new earth with no crime, no fear, no sickness, no death. And it's got all this space, all this room for those who love the Lord. In my father's house, there are many mansions. And he said, and if it were not true, why would I have told you? I would have told you if it wasn't true, but I'm telling you, in my father's house, there's many mansions. And he's given us this and telling us in Revelation. So if we take these 1,500, 1,500, 1,500, this is the equivalent to over 2 million square miles. 2 million square miles. And then you think again, in my father's house, there are many mansions. Oh, yeah. Two million square miles. Yeah. You go from California to New York. Uh, I forgot how much that was from when I used to travel a lot because I was always watching my, my miles, my frequent flyer miles. But what is it? Uh, 20, 2700 miles. And we're talking about two million square miles. In my father's house, there are many mansions. Then we get to verse 17. He talks about the wall. The wall is 144 cubits which is approximately 72 yards or what we would say 216 feet in height. Uh, so this is essentially three fourths of a football field. This is how tall the wall is. Now, this also, if we go back just a little bit that he takes a city that has no fear, no crime and no evil and puts a wall the wall, of course, we discuss is a reminder of God's love for us. But then if you look at the, this wall is really nothing in comparison to the city. The wall is 216 feet high, but the city is 1500 miles. I mean, it's, you wouldn't even, if you were big, I mean, if you put this in context of what, what in, in your height, you wouldn't even trip over the wall. You wouldn't even feel it if you stepped on it, but it's there as a reminder of what God's love for us. And so this wall is as high as uh, three quarters of a football field, and it's still minuscule in comparison in the scale of the city. So in verse 18, he talks about the, the wall, what it's made of. The wall is made of the same material that we read about in verse 11, the jasper and the precious stones. And here we see the difference in what we as humans understand gold to be. 
When we talk about gold, we know it is to be a substance, a metal that is gold in color. Uh, we know it to be a soft metal when it's in its purest form, but it's still a metal nonetheless, and it is gold in color. But here it says the city was pure gold like clear glass. Mm -hmm. Has anybody ever seen clear gold? It, it just, it doesn't even register in your mind because we know gold, not just as the, the metal, but we know gold as a color. It's like someone saying the blue was clear. How is blue clear? <laughs> Blue's not clear. Blue is blue. Gold is gold, not clear. But he said the, the city was made of pure gold, light, clear glass. Unlike the gold on earth, heavenly gold will be transparent. So the overpowering radi radiance of God's glory can retract, be refracted and radiate through the entire city. And, you know, remember, this is two million square miles. So it's going to refract a lot. Uh, think of this uh, 216 foot tall gate, 1500 miles long, gets made of gold, the pure gold. And then in verse 19 and 20, uh, he just simply discusses the precious stones that adorn the gate. Some of the stones we know and some we don't as far as the names, uh, but you don't need to be a gemologist to know that God is using very special and valuable stones around this city. If he has a wall of gold, these stones uh, certainly would be valuable and more than that, all of those stones will be extremely beautiful. So verse 21, he says that the gates of the city is a single 1500 mile pearl. So now the wall is 216 feet, but the uh, gate is 1500 miles. Kind of weird architecture, uh, but hey, we'll roll with it, right? Uh, wait, before we go on, uh, Lisa, you read, right? Yeah. Sherelle, uh, pull up Revelation 715. And uh, uh, where are we? James, are you able to read? Yes, I am. Okay. Revelation 11, 19. And then Isaac, John 18, 12. All right, so this gate uh, is a single 1500 mile high pearl. Uh, these are the gates and not the wall. Earthly pearls now are formed in response to the wounding of a clam or an oyster. Does everybody know how a pearl is formed, right? That the a bivalve creature, the form of a clam or an oyster, a grain of sand gets in and it irritates the flesh of that animal, the clam or the oyster. And as that, that sand continues to rub up against it, it begins to secrete this mucus to surround this grain of sand. And over the course of time, it covers that, that grain of sand so it no longer bothers it. But what comes out of that irritation is the pearl, which is what we consider valuable. They don't consider it valuable. It's just their response to being having this uh, this foreign substance uh, entered into their system and their response to get rid of it or so it doesn't hurt them any longer. So this our, our earthly pearls are formed by this response to this wound, uh, but these um, these gigantic pearl gates will remind all the saints, they should remind all of us throughout eternity of the magnitude of Christ's sacrifice and suffering. So while the clam has to suffer to form this pearl, we don't suffer in order to gain life. The person who suffered that we gain eternal life was Jesus and the pearl represents his sacrifice and his suffering. And we get the benefit and the gain because he willingly allowed himself to be irritated and wounded on our behalf, that now we get to live in a city 
that's 2 million square feet, 1,500 miles long, 1,500 miles wide, 1,500 miles tall, surrounded by a gate and uh, surrounded by a wall. And at each gate, it is made of a pearl that is significant of his sacrifice for us. That was the end of verse 21. Before I get to 22, does anybody have any questions? All right. We're going to read 22 through 27, and that'll close out chapter 21. And Oh, I'm sorry. I left out one part. And he said, and the, the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. And that's just kind of repeating that the pure gold, but it was clear. Uh, I, I, I can't even put in my mind what a transparent gold street looks like. The street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. <laughs> Even with my weird thinking, I can't fathom that. So verse 22, go ahead. I, you know what I was thinking? It's mm. like a, um, a yellow diamond. Mm. That's what came to my mind. Oh, okay. That's better than what I got, <laughs> which is nothing. So <laughs> I'll accept, I'll stand on yours. Uh, verse 22, he says, but I saw no temple in it. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city had no need of the sun or the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated, the, uh, illuminated it. The Lamb is its light, and the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light, and the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. Its gates shall not be shut at all by day. Uh, there shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. But there shall be no means, there shall by no means enter it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. And that takes us to the end of chapter 21. And so here we are back at verse 22. He says, and I saw no temple in it. I saw no temple in it. Early in Revelation, we have read that there is a temple in heaven. We, we're going to see these two examples. Uh, Revelation 7.15, whoever is going to read that. Therefore, they, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. Yeah, so first example in Revelation 7, 15, in the heaven that was before, there was a temple. Is that they will serve him day and night in his temple. Let's hear Revelation eleven nineteen. Then God's temple in heaven was opened. And within his temple was seen the Ark of his Covenant. And there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and a great hailstorm. All right. Now, there are a couple more that we're not going to read, a couple more verses. But the point of the matter being is that when we started Revelation, we see and understand that there is a temple in heaven. But John is saying here in verse 22, and I saw no temple in it. Now we remember that before uh, the, the earth and heaven that existed in the earlier part of Revelation doesn't exist anymore. It is gone. Now we have a new heaven and a new earth. So while the previous heaven had a temple, there is no temple in this eternal realm that exists now. Previously, the temple is where the Lord dwell, but now the Lord dwells among humanity, and now the Lord is the temple himself. 
which is good news for us. That is not that we have to go any place. It's not a place that we can't get to. It's not even a place that we have to go into our prayer closet and, and have hope and faith. Now, the reward for all of our obedience, our hope and our faith is now that he dwells with us. There's no need. Can you imagine that? I mean, just think, I, I, I shouldn't say it like this, but I'm gonna say it anyway. Essentially, you won't have to go to church no more because he will be with us continually. He says, so the previous heaven had a temple, but now there's no temple in the eternal realm because now God dwells among humanity and the Lord is the temple himself. So a physical structure is no longer required. And because he dwells with us, we can commune and fellowship with him directly face to face. The presence of God literally fills the entire new heaven and the new earth, and we will be in this limitless presence of the Lord. Uh, is there a possibility that the reason why the gold is clear because of the presence of God, maybe the gold is still gold, but because it's in the presence and the brilliance of God, that it looks transparent? Mm -hmm. I don't know, just throwing stuff out there. You know, I, I told you I'm a little weirdo with some of this stuff. Verse 23. So he says, the city had no need of a sun or a moon. But think about this. Biologically, life exists. We, we're able to exist and live this life because of the sun right come on y'all somebody say speak talk to me that's right the god is the sun and the moon and all that so he's well, no, but I mean, keep in mind though so we got we know in order for us to live we have to have the sun because if, if we are devoid of sun then plants can't uh, produce fo do photosynthesis. The photosynthesis is what gives us the oxygen to breathe. That's how we're able to live because we have oxygen to breathe. Our carbon dioxide then goes and the plants use that uh, to convert the sunlight into the sugar or the fructose that they need, dextrose that they need to, uh, to continue to power to live themselves and keep going through that whole process, absorbing the sunlight, uh, taking in carbon dioxide, releasing oxygen. And because we have the sun, we live. But now we have talking about a city that has no sun. But it has God. Okay. I just want you to think about that. Because we, we know that the sunlight is the essential part of the essential building blocks to maintain life. So we have God, but is God giving off uh, conducting photosynthesis? Yes. Well, so. God would have to be in the center of this wall in the sky in order to illuminate all of that area. Well, the word had already said that his presence was brilliant and radiates right. throughout the entire city. So it's, it, it, we don't know where he is. We just know it, it's, his brilliance is, is shown throughout the whole city. Omnipresent. And, and do you think that the um, when you're talking about the transparent, uh, the gold is transparent, do you think that the gold that's being used is the purest form and maybe the purest form that we don't even know about is transparent, possibly? That is possibility. See, now you're okay. thinking like me. See, that that's my type of thinking. <laughs> I like that. That's uh, that's the kind of stuff that I would come up with. And that is a very real possibility that mm -hmm. that what we know and what we're able to see is just like having a building that the biggest, the tallest building that we can muster with our technology only can go a half a mile into the sky. And yet God is going to build a city that goes 1500 miles into the sky. And, and it's I don't know why he stopped at 1500, but we know that he can go beyond that. But we know what the word of God says. And it says that the word says that the glory of God provided all the light that was needed. So who had John 8, 
verse 12. Uh, uh, 8 or 18? 8, 8. Oh, wow. Okay, let me go back. I, I had eight, 18 written down here. I may have said 18, so it's yeah, not like that. Yeah. Okay. Okay, 8, 12. Okay. Again, therefore, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in the darkness, but shall have the light of life. I am the light of the world. If you follow him, you will not live in darkness, but will have the light of life. Omnipresent. Yeah, and, and no need for a son. He said, "If you, I am the light. I am the light. Some some of this stuff we as Christians we we miss so much because of it is not just distractions, although that's a big part of it, but it's a lot of stuff that we we want to believe from people that we we thought were this and we thought were that and 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 they've said these things and we want to take them at their word instead of taking it to God's word. Jesus sit here and tells us before we even get to Revelation. I am the light of the world. And we have never really given much thought to what Jesus is meaning. See, when Jesus is talking to us, he's never just talking to us in the context of which we may talk to each other because we are so finite. So if I'm telling you that I got some plans for this weekend, that's usually it. I got some plans for this weekend. There's, there's nothing more to it than that. But Jesus is not talking to us just like I talked to my boy. His, his stuff is going way deeper than that. So when we hear that Jesus is the light of the world, we're not thinking that there's going to be a place where there's no sun because the sun is the light. We're not even thinking of it, the fact that we're going to be in a place where we're not going to need the sun because we'll have the sun. We're not even thinking there and, and, and understanding and appreciating what Jesus is saying. This is, this is actually one of the things that struck me in my preparation for this is, is this idea that I'm going to have to go back and reread the Gospels to see Jesus through a revelation point of view, not just from the way I've always read it, the way that I've always understood it, but now understand Jesus from his very, from the time that his birth was prophesied to the time that he ascends to heaven, his final ascension, to read that and try to understand and discern how is, what is, what is going on from a revelation standpoint of view? Because he tells us, I am the light of the world. And here we get to a place in, in, a, in a book that a lot of people never read that we see the reason that the light that we do have is Jesus. This eternal city, Christ in all his radiant splendor and glory shines forth so magnificently that darkness becomes an impossibility. Now, I want you to just let that sink in again, that he shines forth so magnificently that darkness is an impossibility. This is not just darkness. We're talking about night. We're talking about the darkness that's inside men's souls. We're talking about the darkness that causes people to, to kill and to murder and to rape. We're talking about darkness that will cause countries to attack other countries, the darkness that will cause uh, adults to rape children or even to rape each other. This is... His brilliance, the light of his brilliance is going to shine so magnificently that darkness becomes an impossibility. There is no possible way that darkness can exist in his presence. Now, put this in the context of the people in your circle. I hope I don't step on too many toes. No, I take that back. I hope no, I'm stepping people, on a lot of toes with this. People stepping. People I, I, stepping. I want you to put this in the context of the people who you could, are closely associated with and how much darkness exists in your circle. 
which will then give you an indication of how much darkness is in you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Uh Are are you hearing what I'm saying here? Because if if, if we are talking about a, a son of God that shines so brightly that the actual physical sun that burns in heaven is no longer needed, because and and when he is in the presence that darkness is an impossibility how is darkness in your circle if you are plugged in to the sun seems like it's time for us to change some light bulbs (laughs) (laughs) you know that it it gets to a place see now I have to go back because I didn't I didn't think of this before, but it just hit me just now. I don't even have to go back to my notes. Who's the first group of people that are not going to be eligible for the new heaven and the new earth? Howard. 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 And when it comes to changing light bulbs, we are all cowards. Hmm. we don't want to cut people out of our lives Hmm. for whatever reason (laughs) i love them we've been friends forever this Hmm. is my family but boy lord think about this when you start talking about that how is it i mean because you think about there are some people who have walked away from you Hmm. it's some 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 of us we have driven some folks away because you know they don't want to hang out with us too, no more. I mean, I've, I've heard people say, well, you, you're not the same anymore, Ryan. You're not fun anymore. Well, you know what? I, I'm cool with that because what you're doing, I can't get with no more. That, that was the old me. But there's mm-hmm. still, the light is clearly not bright enough to make uh, uh, darkness an impossibility because there's still some darkness in my circle, which makes me have to question Why am I not changing this light bulb? Mm. Why am I being a coward to tell somebody, you know what? I can no longer uh, afford you in my, in my life. You bring nothing to it. Quite frankly. Yeah. Oh yeah. They, they, they make you laugh. Probably bring you some good Brown liquor every now and then. (laughs) 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 But is it worth it? the cost of, of what you actually have to give up to continue to associate with some of the evil to some of the darkness in your life you know what i'm saying you know there, there's some stuff we accept and put up with by some folks because whatever the reason is for you we got our because and we got to start really thinking is it worth this is it worth do you want to be in the presence where god's light is shining so magnificently where darkness is an impossibility or are you cool with letting in some dark darkness every now and then mm-hmm. well when god god removes that darkness he sure does put a lot of light into your life it makes room <laughs> makes a lot of room for light right <laughs> no. we do what now <laughs> oh, you know those cute. Never mind. <laughs> well, you know, I I was going to um, uh, give an example of uh, that uh, getting uh, darkness out of your life because uh, I've actually had someone to tell me once I changed my way uh, of life, actually told me I like the old person better than I do this the new person. Bring the old person back. See? Which is why I, you know. And that's why I wanted to get certain people out of my life because I had changed, but they didn't like it. No, they, no, nobody likes when you start shifting to something different or, or as some people would like to say, when you start vibrating on a higher plane, I, I hmm. all that. But when you start shifting your consciousness to, to move away from a depraved state to trying to become more enlightened and better, Oh, people, they, they, yeah. they don't, they don't want to see that because they do not want to see it, no. but you know, you know, the reason why your light exposes their darkness. Oh, it most certainly does that. Sure. And, and nobody, nobody, I mean, let me say that again. 
Nobody likes to see their own darkness. So we could, it's just like anything else. We will talk about other people all day long. We can point out everything, everybody's wrong with them, but we will never put that same laser focus on ourselves. Mm. Yeah. yeah. I'm not the one. If they did this, then I would be, well, the fact of the matter is, no matter what they did because of your darkness, you're still going to be this way. Mm. And if they started exposing more light and getting rid of darkness it would cause even greater tension because this light is just too bright it is really showing that i got some darkness that i need to clean up and the problem for most people is they don't want to let go of the dark i can tell you from personal experience in my life before i got saved again i, I tell for i've been saved multiple times the fact of the well, you know people say i got saved again the fact of the matter is you were never saved you were playing like you were saved once you get saved you'll be saved you might have believed you were saved you might have thought you were even saved but the fact of the matter is until you actually become start transforming you've just been playing around and I remember somebody was questioning me about if I was going to be better. I'm like, I ain't given up nothing. This depraved, I didn't think of it in the context that I was living in depravity. But the fact of the matter is, people get, begin to think that darkness is normal. Just, just look at this world today and the stuff that we, you remember once upon a time, we, we thought it was funny to look at tv to see a husband and wife sleep in twin beds oh. i mean it's unrealistic and it was funny but look at what we got on regular tv now it, it almost makes you kind of want to go back to the days of lucy and ricky where they had twin beds what i don't need to know what's going on in folks bedrooms and and the darkness that we see in just simple shows Think about this. They actually had a TV show on Fox called Lucifer. And it's still on. <laughs> so crazy stuff. And, and even had somebody try to tell me, you should watch it. He's actually a good guy. Like that's textbook Bible telling you that he presents himself as an angel of light. He wants you to think he's good. So that you will sit there and watch a show called Lucifer and think nothing's wrong with it. Satan's son is cool. I mean, Satan is cool. Come on. Is he supposed to be helping like uh, detectives or something like that? I don't know. I've never even seen the I, show. I've never watched it either because, I mean, just the name of it. You know, I, I off, not even wanting to look at it. It's just like the, even the vacuum, Dirt Devil. I was, I re, Somebody gave me a Dirt Devil vacuum. I said, I can't I put this in my house. <laughs> I don't want some visibly named devil in my house. No, thank you. Oh. But we are in some dark times. And Jesus, his, his light shines so magnificently that darkness becomes an impossibility. We need to strive to get to a place where darkness becomes an impossibility in our circle. Not just because you have driven them off, but you remain true to who you say you are and true to your faith and just not allow darkness to enter. That takes act of courage, not just to tell people off and to tell them this. See, see Christians have got it wrong. See, they want to believe that if I tell you how bad you are, then I'm demonstrating an act of courage. No, 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 no. Judgment does not take courage, but living a life that is uh, above reproach, uh, being a faithful partner to your spouse, uh, to continue to love one another, uh, to forgive people, uh, to look past others' faults, to help people who are downtrodden. That takes courage to, to, to actually say, I stand for something. I, I, what you're telling me, I, I know what you're telling me, but I, I can't know. 
Uh, it, it's not. It, it's not in my book. And and you know you, you, what you'll always get from people is like you're going to base your faith on a book that was written thousands of years ago and translated hundreds of times. Yes, yes, I am because what you're telling me is exactly what the book said you would do. There's going to come a time when people will abandon sound doctrine and raise up for themselves teachers to satisfy their itching ears. They want people to justify their behavior. They will continue to justify their behavior. They'll continue to justify their life and tell you because your book is old, because it's been manipulated, because it's been translated multiple times and nobody knows God's intent. And it it kind of flies in the face of an almighty God to think that men somehow are going to derail what God of creation created? Come on now. That's going to take courage. Not telling folks off, but standing for what's right and what's true. Brother Ron. Yes. Uh, I'd like to go back uh, to Revelations 21 um, in the beginning. Uh, it, because it was a conversation that Lisa and I had uh, not that long ago when we were talking about here on earth, you know, with uh, the revelations and what's going to happen. And I posed a question to her that, well, if God created the earth, okay, the heavens and the earth, that means that he created the universes also. Mm-hmm. And there's billions of universes. So now reading the sidebar here, It says the entire universe, as we know it, will be destroyed and be replaced with a new creation that will last forever. So now, my guess, my question was, or the conversation we had was, are there other entities out there in other universes that uh, uh, have religions like we do? I have. I'm trying to figure out a good good way to put this. Uh, Believe in God also. And God is going to destroy everything there as well. That's a, a, a good question and a question that I don't have an answer to. Now, there, there will be some that will say unequivocally yes, and there will be some that will say unequivocally no. But I would, say, is, huh? I would say yes, because, I mean, it's, it, it only stands a reason. God is God and God is this powerful. We have all of these universes, you know. It, it depends because, see, at, at one point in time, scientifically, we're going to get to a place where all of this is going to be revealed because whether we don't, under, our understanding is so finite in, in regards to we understand about gravity, we understand about centrifugal force, uh, we understand about the rotation of the earth, that it has to rotate on the axis at a certain degree at a certain speed and cannot increase or change without disrupting life as we know it. Uh, but we don't know if the reason why our universe is able to be intact because these other universes exist, not necessarily because they exist to maintain life out there, but they exist to maintain life here. You see, they're, they're, they may push down or all the, what's going on out there is what's holding this together in the place and the perfect balance in which it needs to be to support life. Right. That's a possibility. Or it could be the fact that maybe he did create other things out there. I don't know. Uh, so it, it's it. Nobody can tell you equi- unequivocally either way. And anytime I come across people who are are hard and fast one way or another, and because of their opinion, I generally turn them off. So now, what do you, what do you think? Of maybe God has created all of these universes. And they all are at certain points in their existence, like we are right now. Mm-hmm. And it could be a universe out there where there's, you know, already gone through the transformation of revelations and they're living uh, with with God. You know, then there is some, I, I don't know. That's yeah, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go that far. Now, now see, you, you are thinking like me, but you've gone a little further than I'm willing to go. Um, I'm, I'm a little out there. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's okay. That see this, these, these are the type of thing people have to be willing to ask questions and, uh, and, and asking questions are, are then cause us to start to think about things. Uh, people generally don't think about 
except think about the existence of anything beyond what we see here, except when they see a science, science fiction movie. Uh, and then that becomes you see ET. Oh, are, is there life out there? Are there other uh, uh, civilizations? Are there other people? Uh, but when we, if we just look at it from the context of what we read today, that he destroyed everything and that the new, you know, the whole universe was gone. So that kind of defeats this idea that there's some people already in his presence, like we will be because it's all destroyed. And then he creates a new heaven and a new earth specifically for his people, the, the people who he loves. It's 1,500, 2 million square mile. Right, right. Well, the reason why I said that is because it said the entire universe, mm -hmm. our universe, the Milky Way universe. So there, we, we know that there's- Oh, uh, let's see, wait a minute. Now, see, you're also, you see, you're putting- our thinking into the scripture. See, John wasn't writing, understanding, knowing that there are other universes. All he knows is what he sees. Right now, yes. Uh huh. So when he says the entire universe, he's writing from what he understands the entire universe. Right. Uh huh. Okay. All right. I'll, I'll sit back. Okay. All right. <laughs> uh, any other other questions before we do any prayer requests? Yeah, I, I like that sometimes they I don't know. I don't know want to know how far I want to go into it, but you know, get all these UFO conspiracy theories and things like that. So, you know, I, I hope it's appropriate to kind of figure out if if they're here you know, or with, I, I didn't find anything in scripture that noted anything so you know i have a friend of mine we go back and forth about it and you know he claims he's seen something you know and you know other people have claimed they've seen something also but i don't make any notation of it in the bible so that's where i kind of i leave it yeah so. all right well you know what we could this is something we can do um after we close out chapter 22 uh that first week uh before we hiatus for 2023 uh have have a, a week or two of discussion from from a biblical point of view because i can guarantee you we could find some scripture and uh theological support one way or another mm. okay thank you mm -hmm. anybody else okay my question has nothing to do with what we're talking about now and it has everything to do with our daily reading so here's my question. When we're reading the Bible every day and when Jesus is speaking, it's always highlighted in red. Mm -hmm. But as we're reading Jeremiah and God is speaking through Jeremiah and delivering the word, why isn't that text ever highlighted? Uh, I don't know. That's, that's a, a very good question. Uh, I don't know the answer to that one. Uh, but I would, I would gather that it has something to do with the fact of, that they want to separate uh, the fact that Jesus is actually speaking as opposed to God speaking through another man. So it's Jeremiah who's speaking through the power of the Holy Spirit as opposed to Jesus actually speaking. So that, that would be, if I was to make a, an educated guess, that would be my educated guess. That's a good answer. Yes, it is. Thank you, because yeah. that's been on my on my mind for like a couple weeks. It, it, good. I'm glad. I mean, at least it, it's it should be there are things that should be thought provoking when we read the scripture. Mm -hmm. You should have said something. <laughs> <laughs> Are you the deacon now of Road to Damascus? Yeah, Deacon Isaac. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Whatever. Now. All right. So, uh, all right, let's, uh, let's go ahead and pray. And then we'll wrap for the evening. We'll finish, uh, 21, uh, we'll finish 21 next week and we'll get through halfway at 22, uh, next week as well. And then, uh, then we'll have the, the following week and we'll be finished with 22 and then we'll be done with our study of the book of revelation. Uh, and so you guys should uh, give yourselves, uh, uh, just, just a little, little pat on the back uh for sticking with it and uh going through this entire book verse by verse 
uh, with this study. And, and even if you've missed a few, it's okay. It, it's, this is not a, uh, we're not keeping up a, a, a list and putting stars by anybody's name. <laughs> The fact of the matter is that you, you <laughs> committed to do something. If you've done it most of the year, you've done something. Because I guarantee you, this is probably the most of revelation that you've actually ever read and actually understood. It and is. That I would agree. Just, just a little pat. <laughs> just a little. Yeah. Maybe, maybe that much. Take it down a little bit more. Uh, so let's go ahead and close in prayer. God, our Father, we thank you again for this time, and we thank you for your presence, uh, Lord, for enlightening us and pouring into us all that you have given us. Thank you for your word that explains to us what is in store for us in the future. Thank you, Lord, for Jesus who went to build uh, this place for us, this, this place that has in your house that has many mansions for his believers. Thank you, Lord, for your word that lets us know that in the end and reminds us that your love has sustained us from the beginning. Your love has kept us throughout our lives and your love will be with us even until the ends of time. We thank you for this gathering of people who continue to come week after week to understand more of your word. And we thank you and praise you for the spiritual discernment that you continue to pour into our hearts and minds that we have a greater and deeper understanding of your word, a greater and deeper understanding of our role in your kingdom, and a greater and deeper understanding of what it is that you would have us to do. God, continue to speak to us, and even through the, the times of doubt, even through the times of uncertainty, when we're not certain what we're supposed to be doing or where we're supposed to go, continue to be our leader, our strength, and our guide, that we will be able to traverse this world understanding that you are with us and leading the way every step of the way. And now, God, we pray for those who are suffering. We pray for those families who lost loved ones in that terrible shooting in Texas. Uh, we uh, pray for those families at that high school in Missouri who lost loved ones. We, we pray for the families of the shooters who are left in the aftermath to try to wonder and assess what went wrong in their lives and try to find some peace when they're facing all types of hell and turmoil. And God, we even pray for the shooters that whatever it is that was troubling them, that you would cast it out of them, that they would begin to feel remorse for their actions. We're not asking that they not pay for their crimes, but God, to just help them understand and, and atone for their wrongdoings. We ask, Lord, that your hedge of protection will extend around every Bible-believing, trusting in you, Christian, that walks this planet that they will no, face no harm from the evil one, that they continue to trust in you and that our faith continue to grow. And for each and every person in this Bible study, whatever is going on in their hearts and their minds, in their bodies, in their homes, in their bank accounts, in their jobs, we ask that you send your Holy Spirit to comfort, your Holy Spirit to give peace, your Holy Spirit to wrap them up, that they feel the love, even in their darkest hour, God, we ask that you touch right now in the name of Jesus, that they will go forward forth from this time, knowing and understanding and believing from now until the time of their death, that you have been their God and they have been your child. We love you, Lord, and we bless you as we leave this place, but never from your presence. We pray, pray that your power will continue to still be with us, engulf us, and lead us and guide us, for it is in Jesus' magnificent uh, name that we do pray and believe. Amen. Amen. All right, y'all. Uh, so if those of you who are planning to come to church, remember Sunday is virtual. Uh, we will not be at the sanctuary. Uh, so if you show up, it'll be you and a locked door. Uh, and we'll resume on the first Sunday in November where our very own Pastor Chris Petit will be bringing the word. The following Sunday is our church anniversary. Nine years of Road to Damascus Church. When some folks said in three months, there'll be door the doors will be shut. In six months, the doors will be shut. At the end of the year, the doors will be shut. Well, they won't make it past three. And here we are at year nine, heading into year 10. Uh, and our own, very own, our good friend, uh, Bishop Kelvin Simmons, will be bringing the word for us to celebrate nine years in building and serving God's children and building his kingdom here on earth. So with that, Y'all have a great evening and uh, have a restful Sunday, whatever it is that you choose to do. 
always choose to serve the Lord. All right. And the one thing I want to leave with you, get you some courage to change your light bulbs. Change your light bulbs, y'all. And I say that from a place of love. <laughs> All right, y'all have a good evening and be blessed, everybody. I love you and you can't do a doggone thing about it. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.